I've often worried about the nature of understanding. What does it mean to understand something? And I think it's one of those examples, of which there are many, where we get captivated by the false idea that inside here somewhere is me, and I understand something. And I genuinely understand it in a way that a mere machine couldn't do. Now, we, we do this all the time. We do it with consciousness and we do it with intelligence. We somehow think there's a little nugget in here that, that has this understanding. But really what is understanding, I think, is the capacity to describe something, to make predictions about what will happen next. So the simple physics, you know, uh, what folk physics, if you like, understanding basic principles of gravity or the raindrops bouncing off that puddle over there. Um, those kinds of things. Do I understand it? Well, to the extent that I can predict what's going to happen next, describe something about, well, if we put some um, washing up liquid in the puddle, then the, they wouldn't bounce in the same way, and so on. It, it's, it's the ability to do those things. And of course, those are things I've acquired through means from other people, physics teachers at school, and then for the rest of my life, watching the world and then having people describe it and learning new terms with which to describe processes. So there's nothing magical about it, but I think what's more interesting is that there's nothing, there's no, I don't think there's a meaningful distinction between real understanding that humans have and some sort of not real understanding that, that a, 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 an artificial intelligence might have or a, a, another animal might have. It's, it's all the same kind of processes played out in different ways. It's very interesting to think about artificial intelligence and whether machines can understand in the way that we do. Well, I think the answer is very obviously, yes, of course they could. But I think generally we make a lot of mistakes in thinking about that. If we think my understanding is some magical special thing to do with my consciousness or my intelligence or something like that, well, then it's not going to be replicated. But if we realize that that a human brain is a kind of kludge. It's a whole mass of different things put together gradually over millions of years of evolution. Well, billions if you go back far enough. Um, with modules that do this and that. Not that it's all modules, but that different uh, parts of the brain are doing different things in different ways. Nothing, it's not true that kind of a big picture comes together for me to look at. The brain is just getting on with multiple different things. And you could say that different, different brain processes understand different things. Now, artificial intelligence at the moment is fairly thin in the sense that um, there are systems that put together lots of different processes, but they're nothing like as many as a human brain, and they're not uh, controlling such a complicated body as a human body, which is, of course, what the brain is for. But in principle, I think uh, there's no reason why um, artificial intelligences won't be able to understand things far better than us, and we won't be able to understand that, them. And the tendency is to say, will we create artificial intelligence that could do this? I don't think it's going to be us creating it at all, it's going to be self-creating. In fact, I think it already is self-creating. And I think this is a really important thought for me about the value of thinking of trillions as a third record. That the, the software that's already out there is doing copying, varying, and selecting on its own with all the other software that's around and with all the data that we are pouring every day into the system. And it's going to clump together into different groups of, of, of processes that will be understanding things. And we'll be rather left behind, is the, is the natural uh, progression from that. People often ask me, are we going to create artificial intelligence that can truly understand, or that has real intelligence, or that is conscious? And there are two thoughts about that. The first is that that question often comes from a misunderstanding of human understanding, human consciousness, human intelligence. Human brains are put together by evolution to be incredibly complex machinery for controlling an actual body, including its speech and everything else. So there is not AI at the moment of that integration and complexity, but it seems to be coming. And it's not coming only because we are making it, it's coming because it's self-making. I, I think if I'm right about the existence of dreams, that is 
information being copied with variation selection that we're not doing, then out there are the same kind of processes starting that started a human brain. Uh, processes that are going to be controlling not a human body, not a body at all, but controlling cameras and wheels on autonomous uh, machinery and, you know, whatever. Still got to do the controlling job. Still, oh, oh, out there is all this information that if it happens to come across it, if it works, it survives. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And in this way, understanding intelligence, consciousness, I would say, will evolve as they did in, in biological creatures. There won't be a distinction between real and, oh, you're just machines. There'll be a distinction between this kind of understanding, this kind of intelligence, and these many new kinds. And um, I think it's time we started to have a look at what's happening and try and understand it in those terms. Our kind of intelligence is clearly embodied, literally, in this body. But there are other kinds of embodiment that are in, very important. And the, the, the coming of the Internet of, thi of Things, which has been, I think, slower than many people predicted, but I think it really is beginning to come now, um, that's a kind of embodiment. And if you think in terms of, well, here's our brain and here's our body, it's quite hard to get yourself, get your head around, but I think it's so. We should think about, well, there's a brain distributed amongst you know, however many billion um, computing devices there are out there controlling all, all kinds of things. Whoa. Now that is so complex, that's way beyond uh, any single human having a clue what's going on. Um, but we could understand in principle the processes that are giving rise to that. And we could ask questions like, what is it like to be <laughs> a system like that? Um, my guess, and my interest in consciousness of course, is so it is a very deep <laughs> and difficult. Um, I think that is only the same kind of thing as when you ask, what is it like to be us? Uh, I don't know, that's a really difficult one. I don't know why I dug myself into that corner, <laughs> but it's the sort of thing I like to think about. We're really bad at predicting the future, and I think we're particularly um, in trouble when we try to predict the future of AI. There was lots of talk about the singularity, but there are different versions of singularity. Is it when um, machines become self-replicating and can you know, reproduce themselves? Is it when they become, their intelligence becomes uh, better than ours, whatever that would mean, it's different from ours. But, um, I think one thing to remember though is that evolutionary processes speed up on the whole. And why do they speed up? Because there's more available um, variation from which to select, and then it depends how strong the selection pressures are, how fast things go. But if you consider how long it, it took first to get from very simple replicating systems that we don't know much about to DNA and then wonder and sexual reproduction and all meiosis and mitosis and all that, then how relatively short it was to get from uh, the beginnings of Homo sapiens to the kind of rich culture that we have all over the world now, um, maybe a couple of million years or something of that order, and then think how fast, I'm old enough to remember, well I wasn't there in the war and Turing's machines and so on, um, but I built a, a ZX80 from a kit, in, you know, one of the very, very earliest home machines you could build. Um, and look what's happened in this short time. And then it's even shorter since the, the uh, advent of the internet and then the web. Things are going very fast and they will go faster. I think we are already, although a lot of people don't want to admit it, we are already at the point where we haven't a clue what's going on out there. I mean, we know how there are billions of computers sending information backwards and forwards all the time and billions of phones with everybody phoning and sending images all over the place. But the whole structure is, is, is too complex now and changing all the time what kinds of um, intelligence are out there we understand some of them some people understand some of them i don't <laughs> um, but some of them i don't think we do and that's going to be more and more clear, more and more true what should we do faced with that situation i i fear that our brains which have already been turned from 
straightforward biological brains into mean machines um, processing cultural information, and they're now being used by the trees, by the third replicators, um, to produce all the machinery on which they run, I think we need to think seriously about what our role is in this world, because we're not going to be able to keep pace with the explosion of intelligence out there. Not intelligence we have created, intelligence we have provided the basis on which it can create itself. Another response that people sometimes have is to say, we've got to stop it now. It's too dangerous, everything's going so fast, we have no idea what all this artificial intelligence out there that's uh, amplifying itself all the time. We don't know where it's going, so we've got to stop it. I don't think there's any possibility that we could stop it. If you tried to destroy every computer on the planet, you would fail. And it would only take a few to be left with the, the internet protocols um, on them. To, for the whole thing to start up again. And there would always be people. Let's imagine we managed to obliterate 99.999% of all computers on the planet and decided we're going to go back to writing in ledgers and things just to prevent the artificial intelligence taking everything over. Just think of the temptation for some young teenagers, you know, with, with a bright mind. Like, Ooh, you know, that little machine there, maybe I could take that and use it and we'd start, and then they'd get their friends going and, you know, before you know it, be up, up and running again. I don't think we have the choice to stop any of this. So what we have to do is try to understand it and try to understand our own role in it before a role we really don't want is forced upon us. What's going to happen to us in this world in which we have inadvertently, if you like, let loose all this artificial intelligence? One possibility is that we wipe ourselves out uh, by climate change or bombs or whatever it might be before the artificial intelligence can survive without us. Another possibility is that it gets to the point where all that machinery can be self-repairing and self-replicating and therefore doesn't need us anymore and doesn't matter if we wipe ourselves out because the machinery, silicon-based machinery doesn't require you know, special levels of oxygen and all that kind of stuff that we need. Another possibility is that we merge with the machinery, that we take artificial intelligence into us. I mean, I love the idea of having a chip or something that would make me able to speak any language. Uh, wouldn't that be nice? Um, and that would have seemed absolutely laughable um, a couple of decades ago, but now with uh, uh, translating programs getting better and better, you can, you can see that it's not, not so far-fetched at all. Like um, Douglas Adams' bagel fish used to get in the air and go. Um, which seemed just like magic at, at the time. Um, I think we'll, we'll all be chipped soon, you know, we'll make, you know, you don't need a passport and you don't need, you know, all your records can be stored on some chip and you just like my cat has a chip in it at the moment, a bit more sophisticated version of that, I think, I think we'll have, but all kinds of cognitive en enhancements we might have. But it's a, it's a scary thought because I suppose it's one of the most fundamental cliches that getting what you want doesn't make you happy, or doesn't necessarily make you happy. So the fact that now so many people want mobile phones, they want to be able to send all their pictures to their friends, they want to be able to you know, spend every minute looking in case somebody's written to them, which really seems to be causing quite a lot of unhappiness, mental overload, stress, fear, um, you know, not feeling adequate in the world of, of Facebook and what have you. Um, we could be heading ourselves by trying to get what we want, the most wonderful cognitive enhancements. If I get much cleverer, then you've got to get cleverer, and so is your friend, and you know, and, and that actually, we may end up even more unhappy and stressed and miserable. I don't mean to be too pessimistic, but I think we need to consider that we are not very sensible animals. If we were sensible animals, we would, 20 or so years ago, we would have changed our behavior dramatically and we would not be facing two degrees centigrade uh, increase in the global temperature quite soon, which is clearly going to be disastrous. And we're not. And I'm afraid to say that gives me a rather gloomy outlook on our capacity to cope with all, all the things we have already let loose. In our concerns about the speed and breadth of progress in artificial intelligence, I think the most important question is to ask what is our role now and what might our role become? 
one of the thoughts I have, which again depends on, on, on biological analogy, is an analogy with um, endosymbiosis. This is the process by which one bacterium or, or similar kind of um, entity it, it takes in another bacterium, and that's why it's called endosymbiosis inside, and they have a symbiotic relationship. This is how mitochondria came about. They are the, the powerhouse, if you like, uh, organelles inside um, the cells of, of our bodies. And they have lost a whole lot of capacities that they presumably once had. They don't have to protect themselves anymore. They're protected inside there. They don't have to get um, the nutrients and so on because they're provided. The, the main cell has given over energy production to the mitochondria. It doesn't have to do that anymore, but it has to protect the, the whole thing. So that's it's a wonderful symbiotic relationship. And I can't help thinking that that's kind of where we might go and wouldn't be a very nice place for us to be, that we're so sucked inside this massive machine that we have created, you know, the cloud and everything, um, based on all these um, distributed machines, that we are only of use to the machines because we keep on digging up the oil and we keep on digging up the gas and we keep on making the gas pipelines and producing the hardware and building the factories and keeping the whole thing going, which enables uh, it, um, exponentially increasing uh, creation of information out there. That doesn't seem a very happy prospect for our role. I would much rather see us integrated into the information in some way or having a more useful I would like to see possibilities of the AI having more benign attitudes towards us, but I'm not sure why it should. These are the things, above all, that we should think about and try to understand, because it, we might not do so until it's too late. Wouldn't it be lovely if the artificial intelligence we've let loose could kind of turn on us and make us behave better. If it cared enough that we don't destroy the planet, that it might help us to change our behavior so that we had fewer wars, distributed the food more e evenly and all the other resources that we have, didn't um, deplete resources so fast that they can't be replenished. But how and why would that happen? This is a question of fundamental motivation. And the fundamental motivation for any replicator, genes, memes, streams, is to get copied and passed on. The world fills up with trees that have won the competition to get some space in the earth. Animals that have won the competition to get enough food and not get eaten. Humans have won the competition to stay alive and have children. And it will be the same with artificial intelligence. Um, the ones that survive will be the ones that have whatever it takes to survive. That motivation doesn't, in my opinion, sit well with protecting this squishy, biological, meme-carrying creature that we are. I don't think it's impossible that artificial intelligence could care enough to want to keep the planet healthy and alive, including us, but I don't really see why it should. That leaves us in the position of having to think, can we sufficiently influence artificial intelligence that it does that? I hear many people talking about we can control it. You can't control an evolution. You don't control evolutionary processes. You can influence them. You can have an effect on them. But you can't control them. They burst out all over the place. And I think that bursting out of artificial intelligence is probably not going to be one that thinks you know, these little human creatures, oh, they, they gave birth to us in the first place, so we ought to be nice to them. I don't think so. You? I suppose the analogy is how have we, the most uh, capable, intelligent, culture-bearing animal on the planet, treated all the other creatures? And the answer is we've exploited and eaten them. <laughs> and in fact, we have, uh, through our means, changed the ge genetic makeup of so many of them. I mean, more, all the cows, which take up a huge proportion of the animals now on, on Earth, cows and pigs and chickens, 
the, their genes have been sculpted by the selection that we've done on them. Huge influence. And that's not mostly considering what life is like for cows. A few people do that, of course they do. And I buy milk from a very small farm with a few cows very close to where I live. But, you know, most milk comes from cows that are bred to carry in all of us adders and that. Pretty strenuous, short lives. No, if we take that as an example, then I think it will serve us right if the artificial intelligence we've let loose goes, oh, poop those little things. We'll keep them alive as long as they're providing energy for us, as long as they're providing hardware that we need, as long as they're scurrying around doing stuff we, that helps us survive. Fine. They can do without us. They would. I mustn't depress myself. <laughs> I tend to despair of humanity's lack of a genuine moral approach to life on Earth. But it's, a, it's an interesting question whether we can use technology to improve our moral ability. Whether artificial intelligence might help us to see uh, not only the harm we're doing, which surely we can see already, um, but ways through that. I don't see why it should, I think, is the bottom line. You, I, I tend to think of all of this in e evolutionary terms. Biological evolution, cultural evolution, technological evolution. And all at all those stages, it is information that can find a way to survive uh, will. This is the whole principle of selfish replicators. Um, the selfish gene was called that, not because genes leave give rise to selfishness in the, in the creatures they produce. They don't, as, as Richard Dawkins explained again and again in The Selfish Gene. Uh, selfish genes give rise to altruistic cooperative behavior. What about selfish memes? Well, selfish memes are selfish in the sense that they'll get copied um, uh, any way they can without regard for the consequences. And the same is true of technological memes or dreams. They will get copied however they can, whenever they can, without regard to the consequences. But I suppose there's a ray of hope in the fact that selfish genes give rise to altruistic human behavior and, and other animals altruistic behavior. Um, so, conceivably, the genes could give rise to altruistic behavior amongst the, the machines. But whether that would be just altruistic to each other, to other machines or other AIs, or whether it would extend down to these lowly human creatures <laughs> who gave rise to it in the first place, that is harder to say.